Hey, it's Joe with Jolie Farms in Ecuador. We've got an exciting video for you today. We've had so many questions about buying real estate in Ecuador that we decided to have our friend Nick Vasey of Instacasa come back and do another interview. So that's coming up. Let's get started. Hey, welcome back to the channel. Glad you're here today. Um, once again, we're here with my friend Nick Vasey of uh, Instacasa and in Real Estate, and we're going to talk to you about buying real estate in Ecuador. Nick, thanks for being here again today. Good to be here, John. Cheers. Well, thank you. Um, so we got a lot of questions from our video last time, and I've had a lot of people who have come here to my home and um, asked a lot of questions about real estate. A lot of uh, guests to Vilcombaba who are visiting here right now. So uh, I thought it'd be a great time for us to talk about that a little bit and some of these questions and some of the questions that you get uh, a lot of times from potential buyers. So I'm going to go right down my list here, if you don't mind. Fire away. Let's We're do it. Pick your brain till there's nothing left. <laughs> let's, see, let's see how we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, can a foreigner buy real estate in Ecuador? Extrajano, I guess we call it, huh? Extranjeros. Extranjeros. Yeah, we can uh, basically, uh, absolutely, yes. Uh, a foreigner can purchase real estate in Ecuador just on the basis of their passport ID. Um, they do not even need uh, any kind of visa at all, actually. Um, uh, whether it's a residency visa or a, perm or a temporary visa, usually, obviously, they have some kind of visa because uh, they're here and they're probably, as we discussed last time, buying sight unseen is generally not such a great idea. Uh, because of how different many things are here in Ecuador. But uh, yeah, just with a passport from whichever country you're coming from, you should be able to effect uh, a property purchase here in Ecuador. Fantastic. And we're examples of that. I bought here before we were actually had our visa. And um, uh, you can also buy a CD here. Yeah, that's another option uh, as part of the investment. The, in the different categories of visas here, you have uh, investment visas, you have retirement visas, you have a business or what's called a, oh, sorry, a business visa, and there's also a professional uh, visa, which is based on uh, academic qualifications. Um, but um, as part of the investment visa, uh, the real estate purchase is one of the options in the, in the subcategories within that visa, as well as a cash deposit or a certificate of deposit, I should say. Yeah. So a foreigner um, could get a visa then if they bought a piece of property and used that property uh, as their investment in Ecuador? Absolutely. Yeah, that's uh, in fact, in the, in the majority of cases, I would say it's probably about an even split in our experience um, with respect to the kind of people that are coming down here. Oftentimes they're using the retirement visa because they're over 65 and they're receiving their pension from whichever country they're coming from. Uh, but also, but if they're not at pension aid, of pension age, and there's obviously a lot of those people as well, uh, then typically the CD or the real estate purchase is uh, the most common way of people getting uh, gaining permanent residency here. The uh, the resident the the CD is sometimes used by people who are a little more well healed financially because uh, it gives them the freedom to be able to sell the property without going through a process of removing the, the guarantee to the state of their residency from that prior to selling the property. So yeah, Perfect. different strokes for different folks, basically. Absolutely. So coming from Texas, um, when we bought real estate in Texas, it's a little bit different than how we buy real estate here. Can you describe the real estate buying process here? Uh, the real estate buying process is run uh, out of Loja, uh, which is the nearby city to Vilcabamba. Um, it is run basically through three, through two government entities and then uh, a pseudo government entity. Uh, so that would be the municipio, which is the municipal authority of Loja, and uh, then via the. Also, we have to check in for some due diligence aspects with the property register uh, to make sure the title is clean and uh, free of any encumbrances, and. Uh, all of that gets channeled through whatever notary uh, the, the parties have agreed to use, uh, the notary office, which is the legal office which uh, works hand in glove with the government offices to ensure that everything is uh, as it should be, clean and above board. 
Notaries are king here, by the way. They're yeah. even more important than lawyers sometimes. Um, and essentially, we've done that process for so long, uh, 15 years running around in there, getting to know all sorts of people for all sorts of things. And uh, we typically run that process uh, for both the buyer and the seller, uh, simply because it's easiest for us to say to whichever party uh, at whichever time what's what, what we need from them, when we need them to show up. Uh, and typically they only have to show up once uh, and that's both at, that's at the end of the transaction when it's uh, time to settle. And they both, both parties basically at that point sign in the notary and, uh, you know, and that's the end of the deal essentially. So, but in, but pre, as a precursor to that, uh, excuse me, as a precursor to that, we uh, have to go through the property register to do the due diligence there and make sure the title is clean. And then we have to submit a whole bunch of paperwork as well as a, an authorization form from the buyer and the seller through the Municipio of Loja so that they can then dot their I's and cross their T's and make sure that they're happy with everything, uh, all the aspects of the transaction as well. Then it comes back to the notary for settlement. Perfect. So not to uh, cheat you out of business, Nick, but do people need a realtor to buy land here? Uh, the short answer to that question is no. Uh, you do not need to use a realtor to purchase uh, property uh, in and around Vilcabamba uh, or in Ecuador per se. Uh, you can buy direct from the owner, uh, but as we covered in our last uh, interview, there are many tips, tricks and traps. Uh, and that those tips, tricks and traps exist even if you're dealing with somebody who's you know, uh, straight up and above board. But uh, here, oftentimes, you're going to not be, you're going to be dealing with some unscrupulous people and potentially some outright criminal elements uh, out with of the, the vendor themselves um, and how they might be misrepresenting the property. So there is a lot uh, of due diligence stuff that can be undertaken or that is undertaken by us. Uh, and Essentially, one of the most important things we have to offer is 15 years of experience here. Uh, we know the histories of properties. We might know, we might even have sold that property before or know someone else who sold it before. We certainly will know who lived in that property uh, and what kind of issues they had. Uh, and those issues might not be something that people would immediately think of. And they might be seasonal issues. They might be to do with bad neighbors. Uh, there are many, uh, there are many things that uh, newcomers here aren't necessarily going to think of uh, that we are going to be able to give them a heads up on. Uh, and if they don't use a, a, reputable real a reputable and licensed realtor here uh, in Vilcabamba, then they can really be lost at sea and they can make uh, some terrible mistakes that are going to cost them. Well, Nick, um, let's just say you're not the realtor for a particular piece of property that someone's uh, thinking about buying. Is there a way that you can help them? Yeah, very much so. Uh, we don't have to be, I think I touched on this in the previous interview, we don't have to be the uh, realtor for the property in question to be able to help uh, newcomers uh, who are interested in finding out a little bit more about uh, the, the situation. In fact, uh, I think I said uh, in the previous interview that it's very disappointing and frustrating sometimes that we don't get more uh, requests like that uh, from newcomers who are about to jump into something that they potentially don't understand or may have been misrepresented to them in some way. And simply because they don't come to us, we can't help them. Uh, but if people take the time to give us a, uh, to message us and to arrange an appointment in town, we can meet them and uh, have a chat for a little while and answer or clarify any issues or answer any questions that they might have. And that half hour meeting uh, could uh, potentially save them from making a great deal of uh, terrible mistakes that are going to cost them greatly uh, in it's the well future. worth it. So that brings up another question somebody asked. Do you have an office in Vilcabamba? We have had a physical office in Vilcabamba for almost 13 years. Um, we closed our physical office uh, in April of 2020 uh, as soon as I realized this uh, pandemic thing was going to be uh, quite serious uh, and we haven't reopened the office uh, yet uh, but we, we're thinking about reopening because uh, we're definitely uh, moving into an upswing of activity again uh, in, for real estate 
in and around the Vilcabamba area. So uh, if that upswing looks like continuing, which it certainly does at the moment, then we will probably reopen a physical office downtown uh, fairly soon. In the meantime, we just literally get a message or get a phone call from from people and we go down, we catch up for a coffee and uh, we ascertain their needs in my uh, in Cafe Lysekas, uh, which is the cafe of uh, uh, the mother of my business partner, Santiago. We go there and, and we catch up uh, and we take it, take things from there. And you weren't the only realtor to do that during the pandemic. I know several who closed their offices and uh, and save money for the almost two years that we were unable to do much business here. Yeah, I think, I think nearly everybody. Uh, I don't think there was really a functional real estate office uh, that was trying to operate throughout the the, la- the, the larger part of the, the pandemic uh, because it just became a little bit uh, depressing <laughs> to yeah. be walking around watching everyone with the masks and the you know scurrying around in fear and all that sort of thing. So I stayed mostly up at my house and did my fitness training and looked after my animals and uh, took it easy for a while while, while the, the rest of the world came out of the madness, basically. So, uh, Nick, can you tell us, how do you find the properties um, that you sell? What's the process? The vast majority of properties that we take on board, uh, people come to us. Uh, we have, uh, as I said before, uh, a very good reputation. We've been doing this a very long time. Uh, Santiago and I have built up uh, great relationships, uh, great friendships uh, with a bunch of people uh, around town. And uh, as I said uh, in the previous interview, we we have built up that uh, good reputation and we've guarded it ferociously. And the vast majority of people who, when they ask around town uh, who, who they should go and talk to, they end up getting referred to us. Uh, and then, and that's how we. Uh, we, we go out with them, we assess their property, uh, we give them an idea of what we think the value is, uh, we do some basic due diligence, and then uh, if we can come to an agreement on what they think is a reasonable price, then we'll list, we'll list the property. Uh, and that's basically how it works for the most part. There, are, there have been occasions when we found out that someone's interested in selling, and we'll reach out to them and say, hey, are you interested in having us represent it? But as I said, the vast majority of people come to us and ask us to help them. So what if a seller is asking way beyond market value for a property? Um, Unfortunately, uh, there have been some things happening lately which have exacerbated uh, that problem. Uh, Bad information is being given to uh, a bunch of uh, vendors and that puts them in a uh, sort of having unreal expectations uh, or expectations that aren't in line with reality. And I will just tell them straight out. Um, I reached a point uh, when I had a chat with Santiago several years back and we decided to change our uh, due diligence uh, filter in terms of taking on properties. And I said, you know what, I'm just not going to list any properties at anything above 20% above what we think the property would sell for on its best day. Uh, And in that way, we keep so if you look at our website, you'll see that there's a, a consistency uh, between what sort of bang for buck you're getting uh, for each property. And if someone doesn't really understand the difference, then more often than not, we can explain it. But if you look across whatever websites or whatever listings are out there online, and you see some wildly variant, uh, a lack of consistency in the pricing, that's something that's very annoying for us because we then have to try to explain those shortcomings uh, to the person that's walked into our office and say, you know, this uh, you're, you're pricing just because someone else is asking for this amount of money and some other uh, inexperienced realtor has decided to list at that price does not mean that your property is worth this. So we have to upset some people. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we have to upset some people, but... Uh, uh, that's life, you know, that's, uh, people are either going to live in reality uh, or not, and we try to help them live in reality. Uh, you probably don't know this, but I was a licensed realtor in Texas at one time, and um, I, I just had the same kind of policy. I'm not going to accept a listing that's way over market value because it's a waste of my time and a waste of their time, yeah. and they're only going to be anxious because you haven't shown the property 
um, but people aren't going to come and look if it's way overpriced. Yeah, it's uh, it just ends up being, like you said, that's a perfect uh, way of explaining it. It's a waste of time. Uh, typically, those people who've uh, overpriced their properties, and I've told them, no, I'm not going to list the property uh, at that price. Uh, they keep it there, maybe with another realtor, and it stays there for six months or a year, and then they eventually come back into my office and they say, oh, you were, seems like you were right. We didn't get any uh, any offers or even any people coming out to look at it. So, so it comes around, but meanwhile, a waste of time. So Nick, I've had this question asked of me several times, and I didn't know the answer to this, but can you tell us what is a promesa de compraventa? A promesa de compraventa uh, literally translates to uh, a promise to buy and sell in respect to the property uh, that's uh, of interest at that moment. So it's a document which essentially outlines uh, all of the salient aspects of the deal, uh, which will typically include all the, dis the property description, the boundaries, uh, the area of the property, what's on the property, all of that sort of uh, detail, as well as the price uh, and the settlement period and the method of payment and all of that kind of stuff, uh, so that everything is clearly delineated uh, in the, uh, at that stage of the buyer and the seller both signing that document. And at the signing of that document, typically is when the deposit is paid as well. So at that point, uh, everything is clearly agreed, there's some earnest money down, and then you move forward with the rest of the transaction through the settlement period. Is there a particular amount for earnest money, a percentage? or? Uh, the deposit is very much uh, up to the, well, the, the deposit will also depend on the kind of settlement period that's agreed. The settlement period is typically, uh, for a normal property, about 30 days, but it can be up to 90 days. Uh, for larger priced, uh, for more high value property. Okay, so um, so then a typical uh, deposit or earnest money would be 10% or sometimes not at all? Yeah, the, the standard uh, transaction would basically be a 10% deposit uh, followed by a month settlement period. But that settlement period can vary depending, and it, and it varies depending on the value of the property uh, the ability of the, the buyer to fulfill in whatever, t uh, whatever time period based on their circumstances. And also the deposit can be re uh, uh, reliant on what the owner of the property wants as a deposit. Uh, so it's really, the owner, if the owner of the property says, look, I want a 20% deposit, then they want a 20% deposit. And that's what it is, yeah. Okay. So once uh, you've settled on a property, and you, they've accepted your offer, so to speak, how long does it take that property to then close? Okay, from the, set, from the, from the date of settlement, which is the date of signing in the notary and the, and the exchange of the remaining settlement funds, uh, typically it is about, give or take, about two weeks. Um, so with it usually within two weeks of the, the property deal actually settling, the new owner will have the newly minted escritura, which is the deed uh, in their hands, and then they're good to go. They can use that deed for their electricity hookup if that's necessary or for whatever other things they need to get organized in respect of the property. They have the deed in their hands and they can move forward with that. So in this closing process, um, who pays for that? The owner, the, the buyer, the seller? Or? Uh, in the, the process, uh, as I described earlier, for the, the process in Loja, uh, involves the municipio, it involves the property register, and it involves notaries. Uh, the, the owner of the property, the vendor of the property, is responsible for all the costs to ensure a clear title, uh, such that it's free of all encumbrances and it's ready for a, a free and easy transfer to the buyer. The buyer is responsible for all of the costs thereafter. Uh, typically, much of the, many of those costs are known here as the alcabalas. Uh, which are the closing costs, and the buyer is responsible for all of those costs. Very good. Um, are there different types of titles here for different types of properties? Or? Uh, the vast majority of our work uh, is done uh, on the basis of the formal title for the property, the deed, which is the escritura. There are other uh, forms of ownership here. Uh, one of them would be 
uh, derechos y acciones, which is rights and actions, and the other one would be another one would be derechos posesorios, uh, and both of those kinds of ownership documents uh, come about usually by way of familial inheritance. Uh, you can work with those properties, but for example, you can't use uh, derechos y acciones or derechos posesorios for uh, a residency visa application. You can transform both of those other forms of ownership into a formal escritura. It's a judicial process. It takes usually 12 to 18 months, and then you can, you'll end up with a formal escritura deed document. Uh, but uh, it's not necessary. Uh, it's only necessary if you really want to do that. Uh, and if so, so if, if in the future you think you're going to be more comfortable selling that uh, property to a, a newcomer, or indeed if you decided that you did want to use that method to get your residency visa, you would absolutely have to convert those other forms of ownership into an official deed escritura. Very good. So once we close on a property, like when we closed on ours here, is there something that's going to be a future cost or ongoing cost to your property? <clears throat> um, there are really only, I mean, once you have uh, taken possession of your property, there are really only a few ongoing costs. There is a land tax uh, each year uh, payable at the Municipio in Loja. Uh, that is a very low amount of money by any measure, uh, by any Western standard. Um, you would have water, you, your services, water, electricity, and obviously most, most uh, people these days are going to have internet as an ongoing cost. Apart from that, you know, I mean, the only other thing that I can think of might be if someone has a canal, then they might be paying a small amount to the, uh, uh, the association that runs that canal for their irrigation water as well as the, the potable water. But uh, really, there are very few uh, ongoing costs, and, what, and those costs, as I said, uh, by Western standards are minimal. When it comes to the water, we kind of covered that in my videos on new water in Ecuador, and uh, we talked about the... Uh, the different fees for the canal and the associations or the juntas and uh, so that we covered that pretty extensively so I want to say when it comes to property taxes um, our house here we have the main house and then we have a casita and then we have a container which we've made into a tiny home we're on about a hectare of land which is 2.4 acres and so our property taxes actually went down this year and there were a total of $63 mm -hmm. yeah property taxes are still uh, at least a uh, I mean, there are semblance of reasonable here in Ecuador, very low by, by any Western standards. I don't think I've ever paid more than 15 maybe $20 for our property taxes at my place. Uh, I guess a lot of viewers out there are going to have a very hard time <laughs> believing those numbers, but uh, that's They're the real. truth. Yeah. yeah, and especially where I come from in Texas, we had the school tax added to the property tax, and so, you know, those bills, I mean, we were getting near $10,000 on our farm, $10,000 annually. So uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty rough when it's like that. It was a real pleasure to be here and not have to pay that. So I want to ask you on the uh, Promesa de Compra Venta, um, does that have to be filed with a notary? Uh, technically, no. Uh, the Promesa de Compra Venta can be a notarized document. Uh, most of the time, for most of our transactions that we've done, uh, it's not. Uh, the reason that you would use a notary is if the, the two parties aren't necessarily that comfortable with each other. Um, but most of the occasions that we're, we're running a transaction, we've got the buyer and the seller uh, pretty communicating pretty well and we're building a nice bridge between them. And under those circumstances, the Promesa de Compraventa is essentially just a written formalization of the agreement. Uh, between those people with respect to the purchase and sale of that property and it becomes uh, at that point uh, essentially a private document a private agreement uh, between those between the parties to the transaction okay I want to ask one last question about visas um, so um, let's say I bought this property and um, I like right now I, I'm on a um, investor visa where I put a CD in the bank and so that's registered, and so that's how I got my permanent residency. But let's say I wanted to change and put my property up so I could get my visa back. Is that possible? Uh, get my yeah, CD people, back, rather. People can, I mean, as, as uh, 
multifaceted as the visa system is here in Ecuador uh, and as changeable as it is, because they do love to change a few laws here uh, from time to time, sometimes yearly, and you've really got to be able to stay on top of that. I think they maybe they do that on purpose to keep, uh, to keep lawyers busy. But um, you can certainly change out of whatever kind of uh, residency visa that you have uh, into another format of visa. It's a, obviously a bureaucratic process involved there and you're going to probably use a facilitator or a lawyer for that. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, for example, if you had uh, a CD, as you said, and you wanted to flip out of that and go to use your property as the, the guarantee of your residency in, in country, uh, then you can absolutely go through that process and, and then get that CD back out of the bank and use it for something else. For sure. I had a friend just do that. He had his property um, was his um, guarantee for his visa, and he wanted to uh, subdivide the property and sell off a piece of it, and so he was able to undo that process and make that happen. Something that people need to... Um, uh, need to realize and I think I touched on this before with the CD uh, obviously sometimes people are well healed uh, enough to be able to use a CD without any any problem uh, and still have the money that they that they need to be able to purchase their property and build their home or, or whatever but if you do uh, have the lien uh, for the guaranteeing your residency against the property you have to be prepared at the time, at, at any time in the future that you want to sell the property, you have to be prepared to go through a process to remove that lien uh, prior to the transaction being able to go through. Uh, and depending on, sometimes that can take uh, a bit longer than you might think, and it might be critical at that stage that uh, the, the buyer is there, they're ready, uh, and, if, and that could be a delay that loses, uh, loses a deal just on the basis of the bureaucratic process not going quite as quickly as the buyer might like. So there's that to keep in mind as an advantage to having the CD over having the, uh, the lien against your property. And, and that's why we did the CD. We, in the first place, yeah. Yeah, sure. So we're going to cover all about residency visas and the different types of visas when we interview our friend uh, Isabel Mascara in uh, Cuenca. And so that'll be coming up. Look out for that video, and uh, hopefully you'll get to watch that one too. Nick, is there anything that you'd like to say to our viewers before we sign off? Um, I think you were going to ask me a question about why people would come to Ecuador. Yes, we were going to ask you that question. <laughs> um, because uh, it's, it's, it's always interesting uh, over the years uh, to have spoken to so many people who, uh, and as to why they, how did they find, and everyone has a story, you know, I mean, it's really interesting to hear those stories. But um, for, my, for my part, I think uh, that once you get through, the first couple of years can be kind of uh, hectic and difficult, and you have to have some patience and you have to have some persistence. Uh, but once you jump through the, the various hurdles of bureaucracy to get your residency and to get your property and to start doing your building and get your house, you know, your, every, all of that out of the way, then you really are in on easy street. After that, it's uh, you can find a beautiful, beautiful places to, to live. You can build beautiful gardens uh, and be living in really a tranquility haven. Uh, and that's what most people do. They build their sanctuary uh, a little bit outside of town, two, five, ten kilometers, whatever, and uh, and then they engage with the village at will. If you want to go down and have have some uh, some drinks or a meal with some friends, then you can go down to the village and do that. And out with of that, you're in, as uh, Joe's explained so well with so many videos here, you're in your own uh, private wonderland uh, sanctuary and you can just chill out uh, and enjoy your life. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to link right up here to one of our videos uh, that says, why in the world did we move to Ecuador? So if you haven't watched <laughs> yeah. that one, click on that one because it explains a lot about why someone might want to buy real estate here and live here, et cetera. And I think that's a good explanation. All right. Well, folks, we hope that you'll subscribe and give us a thumbs up. If you have any questions at all, please reach out to us. Leave a comment below. Nick will get back to you or I'll get back to you. Or we'll both get back to you. And uh, we appreciate every one of your comments and it helps other people. Uh, when you ask those questions, because sometimes there's a lot of people who are raising their hand asking questions, and then there's a few people doing that. And some people don't ask, but they're thinking these questions. And so when someone else asks them, that, that gives them an opportunity to then uh, go in and get this information. Yeah. 
all my uh, details, like with the last interview that I did with Joe, will be under under the video here, uh, contact details, and, and you'll be able to get in touch with me or my business partner, Santiago, uh, online uh, or in person if you come to Vilcabamba. So we look forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. <laughs>